The other thing I've learned over the years, many of my children have a different personal space. So be conscious, some of my students need you to actually give them quite a lot of space, so don't get up too close, too fast. Some of my students love deep pressure and love me being close. Some of my students are best, I know when my kids were teenagers and they were learning to drive, I had my best conversations just sitting next to them, not giving that eye contact can be painful. So that's one of the things in my report I actually ask. What is their personal space? What is the best way to communicate with that student? Some of my students just sitting next to them, not saying anything for a minute, can be really, really powerful um, and giving them space. Thanks, Jennifer. I'm seeing you nodding your head. I always feel like I'm talking to myself, but really being aware that this student's way of engaging can be different to their peers. And the same in the younger years. If this child's lying on their stomach, you need to lie on your stomach. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Sue Larky podcast. As I always say, you have to embrace difference to make a difference. Let's dive into today's podcast. Fantastic. Let's go then. Fabulous. So I have put on record. So um, today is recorded. If you've just joined me, we do not record the chat or any of the photos. No one sees any of that. All people get is the big screen of me in the replay. Anyone watching the replay, welcome. You can still win prizes even if you're watching the replay. I have got all your fabulous questions. Some people who sent in questions, let me know they're watching the replay and I really appreciate that to know that you're going to grab this um, replay later. So welcome everybody. If you haven't printed the handout already, what I'd recommend, grab your phone or your iPad or device and just put it over the top of that QR code. The reason for that, there's some other fabulous tips in there that are really going to help you along the way. So for example, there's a lot of you who were secondary and recently I did a podcast because um, Joan Shanahan who worked in Armidale and um, in that area of growing out to schools for many years helped transition a lot of children, particularly from small regional schools to big um, schools like in Tamworth and Armidale. And she had some fantastic tips on transitioning children and she had must do ideal and extra for great success. Now, I think these are very practical across all ages and stages, um, but we also did a podcast on episode 168 where we actually went through these in more detail and Joan gave a lot of great examples of that. So make sure you just scan that um, handout so you can at least refer back to this. Um, teachers, I recommend give this to parents and get them to listen to the podcast. There's some great stuff on there, including stuff like vaping. We need to prepare kids for vaping. Give me a thumbs up if you agree. That's a change in the last two years that we need to get, thanks Carol, kids ready. And I had a mum say that was the biggest sensory challenge for her child. Can you imagine the smell of all the vaping? It's really quite dramatic change. I sort of can't believe we've gone back to it, to tell you the truth, after years of no smoking. But anyway... That's uh, the tricky. Um, the other thing in there are some great resources um, at the back of the handout. Because if you go to my website, it can be a little bit overwhelming with all the resources on there. And one of the ones I'm going to recommend, if you've got the handout, just turn to the, I think it's the second, yeah, the second back page. There's one called I'm Going to School, which Anna Tullamans, um, who is a parent and who I've written a lot of books with, she made this great book and I actually find it really helpful to update every day, every year with this children. But what Anna has in there is a fabulous reference. Like, I think these are really important things. Having a diary, telling the child when they're going back to school or um, some schools year seven start before other years. So actually having a visual diary that tells students what's happening when. Um, and then in this case, this was a childcare, having a photo of the childcare centre. Um, and then for her son, he was a map boy, knowing which way they were driving to preschool or school and the same for secondary. In fact, when he got to secondary, she used to purposely take a wrong turn on a good day to get him used to change and problem solving. So she'd purposely take a wrong turn and he'd be, she'd like, okay, what can we do? We can pull over 
and we can think of another way. And she used roads and taking wrong turns as sort of analogy for him with assessments and work that what's your plan B? What's your plan C? What can we do? You know, and really showing kids that problem solving. So any parents on today, I think that's really important. Then a map of the classroom. Now in secondary, when I worked in a base room in secondary, one of the challenges I found every classroom was set up differently and they'd move things around all the time. And this, any of you in Victoria or, and South Australia have a lot of those supersized classrooms now, a lot of those big open plan. Um, and I often find I still need to draw a map of the classroom or, um, you know, and ask teachers maybe keep it the same. Because what happens over the holidays, teachers rearrange, give me a thumbs up. So they go for transition, it looks one way, and then they turn up the first day and it looks like a completely different world because when they went for transition, it was under the sea. And when they come back, it's uh, space. You know how confusing that can be. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you, Susie. Um, and then Anna's got lots of photos. And I think those photos to refer back to are invaluable no matter what age, you know, where to hang up your bag. All of those things are so important. Um, a map of the playground, um, particularly if you're in a big school, what I've found over the years, particularly in... Um, some schools that have different areas you're allowed on different days, actually letting them know which day they're allowed on which equipment can make a huge difference. Um, and then some a photo and information on the teacher. Now, anyone going, but Sue, we don't know the teacher. I know, that can be hard, it really can. But having taught in schools for a long time, often you have an idea who the teacher's gonna be I would actually say it's really important that we do know and prioritise. Now, I am going to talk a little bit later about, oh, but the other children, they don't know their teacher. This isn't the other children. This is a neurodiverse child. And in fact, it's not fair on the teacher or the child. We need to prepare both. Um, those of you who get my easing, we don't send a, a minor down a mine without information. We actually prepare. And I think that is the key actually preparing both the staff and the student. And if we can know who the teacher is, or say, you know, hopefully this will be your teacher, um, sometimes there's a change and pre-warn them. Anyway, lots of important things. Toilets, where out of bounds are, where they can eat, because some schools have rules on eating, where they can drink, really important information. So that's books called I'm Going to School and I love it and I like to update it every year and I've got some students who have updated it every year through um, early childhood right through to primary school. So I just wanted to show you that as a great resource, particularly for any children who just need something to refer back to. Okay, so let me go here. Um, so you are in the right spot, whether you are getting a student that new to you, you're passing on a student, you're a parent, a carer, a teacher assistant, angels I call you, I'm thrilled to see 20% of you have done my teacher assistant course, whether you're an allied health professional, because often you're the one who's consistent, actually, my speech here OT will be consistent next year, but everything else might change. And I personally love the word neurodiversity. I um, think it's a very important term because it really encompasses so many of our students. Um, and neurodiverse students, and um, sorry, I thought I had a visual, but sometimes when I put things, I forget them. But any children who think and engage differently and need us to really plan that transition. Neurotypical children are very, um, normally, can cope quite well with change. But for children with autism spectrum, ADHD, trauma, anxiety, for children with OCD, any neurodiversity, this is a huge challenge for many of our children. So what is transition? Well, for me, it's between classes and year levels, early childhood to primary, primary to secondary, secondary to post-school option. We tend to think about those big ones. But I think just changing school years can be a huge transition for many of our students. So I just wanted to acknowledge that for, it doesn't matter even if a child's been in a school for three years, if they're moving to another year level, so we still need to think about how we support them for that. Um, there is also an ebook, which I'm sure lots of you have seen as well. The ebook, I just wanted to point out, because some of you had questions around this, so I like it on my iPad. 
there's a really good checklist in there for strategies a lot of them I'm going through today but there is sorry I'm putting my face right in the wrong spot but there's also some really good tips for children starting school like a lot of parents go out and buy a new lunchbox over the holidays and the child doesn't know how to unzip it or open it. I would be getting that lunchbox now to prepare them how to use it. Um, or they change from a different um, drink, like a lot of the preschools have a cup they can drink out of and then they get a drink bottle to go to primary school and they've never used that. I prefer we start getting them ready now. And I know I saw there are some Te um, preschool teachers on here from around this area that I know um, a lot of them get the children to wear their uniform in for the last few weeks and bring in their bag and other things to get them ready um, for school and I think that makes a huge difference and there's also some little tips there on secondary in that ebook so I highly recommend you download that I also had a parent who oh, Jess has a child starting preschool um, Jess, with starting preschool, my experience, a lot of it is about separation anxiety. So in that ebook, I've got a whole lot of great tips, but also um, from parents where I asked on Facebook and I got lots of great tips from parents. Now, there was someone with a child in secondary who has anxiety too. Um, and again, I would be looking at those separation anxiety tips because some of my students, that ongoing anxiety is every year that separation anxiety comes up and how we address that for all of our um, students. So I just wanted to point out there are some extra tips in there beyond what I'm going to dive into today. Oh, I have got that neurodiversity visual. I wonder where that was hiding. Sorry about that. So I personally love the word neurodiversity. What I'd like you to do is share in the chat which of these students are you thinking about today? All anxiety, ASD, ADHD, gifted, brilliant, thank you, trauma. So, yeah. And I tend to find there's a combination. Thank you, Kathy. Excellent. Love it. Fantastic. Brilliant. Okay. So I'm fascinated at all the different things that are coming up in the chat. And this is my experience. So those of you who don't know me, I'm a teacher. I've been teaching for 30 years. I've worked in mainstream specialist. I've worked from early years right through to post school options. And what I find is every child is so individual. And what I wished I'd known 30 years ago is that I'll never meet two children the same. Every child I meet is different. Give me a thumbs up if that's your experience. Yeah, fantastic. And strategies wear out. Give me a love heart if you'd wish you'd known that, that, that strategies wear out. Things work for a while and they stop working. Particularly for my secondary, I just want number two, if you're in secondary, can you highlight this and talk about it as a staff? Not every strategy works for everybody. What I mean is if you're the history teacher and this student loves history, you're, not, you're going to have a very engaged student. But if you're the phys ed teacher, you're going to have a very different student who mightn't like phys ed just getting changed into phys ed and everyone's putting the deodorant everywhere. Some of my students find that really hard in secondary when they move to secondary. But the same in primary you might be the teacher assistant and have a very close relationship and knowing that student for a while and then they get a new teacher. Not every strategy works for everybody. And I think this is really important. Parents, what works for you mightn't work for school. And so often I see programs that just have one idea. Personally, that's why Anna Tullemans and I, in our books, we'll put like 10 ideas to try, you know, a whole lot of reasons for shutdowns and meltdowns and what to do, you know, um, how to develop friendships. There's like, gosh, 15 key ideas to help develop friendships because not every strategy works for everybody and strategies wear out. So we need a range of strategies. In my experience, most strategies work for one in 10 students, people. And if you can find that one strategy, it can make the world a difference. Now, can you believe it's already November? But I want you to take a moment, if you have had this child all year or know this child or a parent, can you share one strategy that makes the world of difference to the child you know? What is one strategy? If you're away or getting a babysitter, there's one thing you'd say, make sure you do this. If you wanna have a good day with this student, 
What is one thing that everyone needs to know? Thank you. Listening to music, visual aids, sitting at the back of secondary. This is fantastic. Redirection, having a conversation. I love that. Clear instructions, routine, stay calm, listen. Don't interrupt them. This is brilliant. I love it. Music, step-by-step -step instructions, safety pack, checking in. This is the checking in is so important. Thank you. Visual timer, absolutely. And warnings, follow be at their level, point of connection. This is amazing. So this is the key stuff we have to hand on, okay? And so often um, I find we hand on these big folders and we just, we really just need these key things that make the world of difference. Those of you that have done my um, full day workshops, I really recommend your, and this is on my um, website as a free um, download, but reading your questions today, I realized this was something, probably something I should refer to. Um, it's a summary profile of the student and it's just like a one pager, just like we have up anaphylactic asthmatics. I don't have their diagnosis on there because legally you shouldn't be disclosing that to anyone coming into the school, but it's just put a photo of the student, some key information about them. I think this is vital. In fact, I really believe that for neurodiverse students, their biggest challenge is you can't see the challenges they face. I think these are the bravest kids you will meet. If I live with as much anxiety as some of my students, I would be in bed all day. If I couldn't communicate, I would fight, get so frustrated. So a lot of this afternoon is about putting ourselves in a student's shoes and really understanding what it would be like. But I think the biggest challenge we have is getting other people to understand this student's differences. So I have a bit of an interesting question to ask you. What I would like to know is this is, oh, sorry, I stopped, forgot to stop sharing the last one. Do you think the other students have noticed this student's differences? I would like, we'd love to hear your thoughts. So just yes, no, or maybe. Wow, gosh, you're quick to answer this one. I was hoping to get a cup of, a little sip of my cup of tea. Wow, okay, so interesting. 88% of you said yes. 1% said no, and 11% said maybe, maybe. I think that's actually absolutely what we see, that at least 80% of our children, it is quite obvious to their peers. My guess is the 11%, probably the children are a bit younger. Um, under five-year-olds often aren't so aware of differences, and particularly our children who are harder to diagnose or um, often are good at masking. You know, some of my students are experts at masking, but 80% of our kids notice, and I think that's right. And that's why I love the saying, embrace difference to make a difference. When we are putting in place these accommodations and differences, the other children are highly aware of the differences. And this is why it's really important that we all know who the children are and be aware of those differences too. Okay, so, we can have a prize. So you can win a book, but having read your questions today, I'm sort of going to change now. Oh, bang, sorry. Do not put your hand up to win the book. Okay, now what I decided, because there's some secondary on, and I actually think this book's great from year five and above, you can choose which book you win, either the ultimate guide or the essential guide to secondary school, because I felt with so many secondary on, I should offer a secondary option. So all you need to do is just stay where you are, do not move, and I'm going to choose some winners. Jane Butterworth, you are a winner. Fantastic. Uh, Sarah Spence, you are a winner. Laura Mayer, you are a winner. Uh, Judy Flack, you are a winner. And Andrew Healy, you are a winner. Don't worry, there'll be more prizes coming up. So, in the um what in your handout is just whoop boom um that you just need to email andrew let him know which prize you would like his email address is in your handout oh sorry if you're early years and you prefer the early years book you can choose that too so just choose which one of those books you would like to win and if you're watching the replay all you have to do is answer a quick question which will be underneath the replay where to answer that question. 
and you still get to win too. And guess what? Even if you're on today, you can go on and answer that question and still have a chance to win. So I like to reward everyone and make it fun. So um, what I want to know is this. If you were starting a new job or returning from leave, what would you want to know? Now, I don't want to put in the chat yet. What I like to do when we're doing Zoom is think, share, compare. So I'm going to give you 10 seconds to think. So just write it down on your page or have a little think. And I like to practice what I preach. Children with ASD like to see the time. So I'm gonna give you 10 seconds just to have a think. What are all the things you'd wanna know if you're starting a new job or returning from leave? Okay, so next I want you to share. So share in the chat what you would want to know. Who are my peers? How long will I be there? What changes have occurred? So if you're returning from maternity or from leave, uh, start and finish times. Dress code, yes, that's always stressful. If you've ever been uh, in a casual job, knowing what to wear is always a tricky one. Uh, who will be there? What are the expectations? Who do I ask for help? This is awesome. I love it. Okay, where do I have lunch? Do I have to bring lunch? Is lunch provide? Who will I work with? What is my timetable? This is amazing. What's the hierarchy? Well, I tell you, I've worked in a lot of schools. That's not always obvious, but what duties do I have? Are there any special days? Um, are there any procedures? That Excellent, this is so good. When is lunch? Yeah, where are the toilets? Give me a thumbs up if you'd wanna know where the toilets are, you know? when you're going to a new school. Okay, so, or a new place. So I actually think you guys are amazing. So I love the think, share, compare. Um, and for many of you, if you have a little flick back through the chat, I know it goes up really fast, but just take a moment to look back. Like the environment, Yanka wants to know about noise. This is great. Where to park? Do you know, when I go to schools, I always ask for a map because schools can be overwhelming where to park. This is great. I love it. Who's in charge? This is amazing. Well done. So, um, so what did you want to know? Give me a thumbs up if the, which one of these was the most important for you? The who, who will you be working with? Who, who, who do you have to report to? Who needed to know the who? Give me a thumbs up if the who was the most important for you. Okay, give me a thumbs up if the what, what are you doing? Where do you have to go? That, sorry, the what, yeah, excellent. What about the how? Like, how, how do I get there? How do I, you know, sort of the, the more the how, I'm trying to think what the how would be, sort of like that how, how do I park? How do I go? Um, when, when, who wants to know the timings? Give me a thumbs up if it's what time you need to be there, when the break was, who had that? Who was a when? Thank you, Andrea. And did anyone ever want to know the why? Why do I have to be there? Why do I have to do stuff? Because I think a lot of us as adults forget, for many of our students, the why is a really big one. For many of us, if I look back in the chat, a lot of you didn't have the why. And when we do transition, a lot of my students want to know why. Why do I have to go to school? Why do I have to have a change? Why do I have to leave preschool to go to primary school? Why do I have to leave school to go to post school? Like, why do I have to get a job? Why do I have to choose a career? Like, a lot of my ADHD, ASD kids, as, well, what we used to call Asperger's, they want to know the why. That, that is their main thing. They want to know why. Why do I have to do these subjects? Why do I have to do things? So, can you give me a love heart if you agree that something we sometimes forget, the why for some of our students, the why the things are changing. Why do I have to change teacher assistants? Thank you, Kristen and Inez. Thank you so much. So the interesting thing is, I think if you're starting a new job or returning from leave, the biggest challenge you would have are your emotions. So if your name starts with an A to F, can you just share in the chat, what emotions would you be feeling about starting a new job or returning from leave? What are the emotions that would come up for you? Apprehensive, scared, anxiety, overwhelmed, a little nervous. Excitement. See, some of my students do feel excited about the new year. 
But a lot, of, even that excitement can be confusing for some of my students. Some of them have that excitement and then they're very distracted. So I think the other thing we don't address is emotions enough. We don't talk enough about the emotions and how to, when you feel those emotions. Now, parents who are on here, I hate to tell you, but if your child's moving from preschool to school or moving schools or primary to secondary, often you're anxious. And my experience is the children pick up on our anxiety too. It's not just their anxiety, it's their anxiety. Give me a thumbs up if you've seen that, by the way. Who has seen where the children have nearly a six cent? Thank you, Isabella. Thank you, Stacey. Absolutely. So I think when we're doing transition, it's really important we talk about emotions too. And we talk about our own emotions. We talk about how we feel when we're starting a new job, how we feel when things are happening. I always think that often when we share our own emotions, it gives the children permission to talk about their own, but also to label them. A lot of, I think 20% of you have done my emotional regulation course, and I call it emotional literacy. Just like we teach reading and writing and we teach the letters of the alphabet and phonics, all these things, we need to teach about emotions because many of our students don't know what this anxious feeling is. They might say they feel sick or tired or they might know how to express those emotions. However, here is the challenge. The higher the anxiety, the lower the problem solving. So if a child comes in, and there's a different teacher, and they're already anxious, they mightn't be able to problem solve that. If they come in and they were told they're gonna hang their bag up in a specific spot, and suddenly there's another bag there, the higher their anxiety is gonna be. So we know the higher anxiety, our amygdala actually starts to panic, and therefore we find it hard to make decisions. And that is why transition is so important. Because if we do transition, what we're doing is working through the problems. And even though the child might be anxious, it's going to stop that anxiety when we go the first day. The more transitions we can do, the more um, getting used to and talking through the emotions and the problem solving, not just a whole day in a whole new school, just going and doing visits, the better it would be for most of my kids. So, I wanna talk through what are we gonna do. So first of all, the student. In my experience, if we are transitioning a student, we need to know who do they know? What student or staff? Now you might be going, but Sue, they're starting at a new school. How would they know? But how do you know they don't have a brother or sister that already went to that school? And so they have visited. Or they've got a brother or sister that went to that high school and they've been to events at the school and seen the school and seen the staff. That's very different to if they've never had a sibling, cousin, anyone go to the school. So I always want to find out, has this student had any prior exposure to this school? Give me a thumbs up if you think that's something we sometimes forget, that we sometimes forget, hey, yeah, they've actually been to sporting activities there or they did swimming lessons at that school. So they actually have a bit of prior knowledge because the more prior knowledge, the easier the transition's going to be. Now, I would highly recommend with the students that you do find that mentor. If there's a neighbor or someone or a child they knew from previously at that school, finding those mentors are really important. Who do they know? For some of my students who are transitioning between classes from year four to year five, for example, they often wanna know who's gonna be in their class more than they wanna know who the staff are. Can you give me a thumbs up if that would be more important to your student? Who they're with more than who the teacher is. Thank you, Irene and Murray. Yes, so I've had students over the year that that is more important than who the teacher is, knowing which friends they're going to be with. Um, and then, of course, drinks, toilet breaks. Um, to drinks, toilets and eating breaks. For many of my students, particularly when they move from primary to secondary, the rules can really change around that. Often in primary, they can ask to go out during class. Some secondary, it depends on the teacher. So it's really important that we find out how that child goes with interception. So remember, interception is their internal. Internal is, do they know they need the toilet? Do they know they need food or drink? 
Or are they a child that say they're not hungry, they're not thirsty because they actually aren't, their body hasn't told them. So with interception, many of our students don't know they're hungry, thirsty, tired, um, or need the toilet until it's too late, actually. So that's why we do preventative breaks and put in those set times. When I worked in a base room in secondary, we had set times they could go and classes where we'd pre-negotiated that, not to the bathroom when everyone was there. Tell me in the chat, what were the school toilets like in your secondary school? Come on, or at your school. Tell me what they're like, tell me. Yes, gross, horrible, disgusting. When Julia Gillard and Kevin Rudd were doing that building the school revolution and they're building all the new buildings, I didn't want new buildings in schools. I wanted new toilets because I work with so many children that the toilets, thank you, Jennifer, the toilets are disgusting and they're a massive barrier to learning. I actually wanted new furniture and new toilets because I also go into schools that the tables are rickety. Have you ever been to a coffee shop where the table wobbles? Imagine you're in a secondary school and your table's wobbling and your chair's uncomfortable. I think that stuff's more important than beautiful big buildings, but that's me. Buildings are nice, but I actually think that stuff's really important. Playground where to go, who to go with, and how long. Of course, that all makes sense. But I just want to spend a little bit of time on uniforms. No matter what age, parents often get new uniforms, new shoes, new socks to start the new school year. And for many of my children, that is a sensory disaster. So if you're going to get new leather shoes, because secondary you have to wear leather shoes, they need to start wearing them now. If they're moving from primary, um, early childhood to primary, and they have to wear a certain shoe, we need to go and get them. The heavy shoes are very different to their Dora the Explorer runners they've been wearing for three years. Some of my children, new school uniforms are scratchy. Anna Tullamans recommends buy secondhand uniforms because they're already worn in, okay? The other thing with uniforms, buy a backup. So if it's a school that needs a tie, have a spare tie, but just buy a second hand one. You don't have to buy it all new. Make sure you got a spare hat, you know, make, cause part of, for neurodiverse children, one of the biggest challenges is executive functioning, which is remembering things. So we need to accept that they are gonna lose things, that we do need to have those things. And if your school still uses books, which some do, you know, go to the second hand, um, sale day or get on eBay or Gumtree or even Facebook um, marketplace and have a set of books for school and a set for home. Trying to get books between home and school in secondary can be a disaster. And anxiety I've talked about. But the other thing I think we need to talk to many of our students, which they get really worried about if, what if my teacher's away? Now, any of you who are joining me for the live virtual or coming to my face-to-face -face workshops, I now send out a social script, what to do if your teacher's away. I think it's really important that we pre-warn, what if my teacher's away, what to do. Some of my children, that is their biggest worry. And in secondary, it can still be a big worry. We forget that often when there's a substitute teacher, the other students muck up and that can confuse my students. Give me a thumbs up if you remember that. When there's a relief teacher, it's not about the relief teacher, it's about how the other children behave, yes? One of my boys, because they'd swap names, that would make him so anxious, like children changing names, that's really worrying. Okay, if you had a new employee coming to work in your team, what would you want to know about them? If your name starts with a G to M, what would you want to know about someone coming to work in your team? So if you had someone starting tomorrow, their name, their experience, their background, excellent, their skills, their strengths, excellent, all of their things, their interests. So interesting, the name. Knowing a student with Autism Spectrum's name is one of the most important things. It's a great way to build rapport. We do know that, but I think in a secondary, you sometimes forget, this is a kid's name I'd be learning first, by the way. This is the name, and that's why having a photo with information about them, that one page is so important. So, um, if you were starting a new job, what would you want people to know about you? If your name starts with an N to Z, what would you want people to know about you? So we'll reverse that. Where they came from, their interests, this is fantastic. Do you love chocolate? Yes, Maureen, that is very important. I'm with you. I don't know how people do those no sugar things. 
So I'm just looking on here. So um, you would have got an email this week from me that has one of the most important documents I've used over many years, which is 10 things about me, helping the student actually introduce themselves and finding out about them. I have found this invaluable and teacher assistants, I find you're often the best person to sit down and go through this with the child, finding out what they're really, really good at, what they love doing, what they hate doing. Letting the child self advocate is so important. And I have just got 10 things. Now you can adapt it. I've sent it to you as a, a Word doc so you can adapt it for your student. But it's a great starting point for them to self advocate but put a photo of them doing something they love. So Maureen, I would have a photo of you with your favorite chocolate. Because when you've got 30 children in your class or you've got 100 kids through your classroom in a week, having that visual with them doing something they love, whether it's Lego or dinosaurs or one of my boys that was rock climbing, having that visual really reminded me of what that child loved rather than this school photo and they all look the same. So actually having a photo of what they love on there is fabulous. Now, I know some of you mentioned your schools already have documents. I often see too many documents in schools. Oh, and in that substitute teacher, I also have, what do you want a substitute teacher to know about you? And I think that's really important too. And it's much easier to do it this year than next year, because often the start of the year, there can be a lot of staff changes. So I think getting that information sorted now is really, really important. So. Um, with our reports, in um, I also sent you my, that I've developed, I was working in Victoria many years ago and I discovered there was, different schools had different documents. So I sort of created my own individual student profile. Again, it's a Word doc. And the reason I like to do it as a Word doc is so you can just update it every year. Um, and I find that invaluable. But if your school has something, that's great. The one that I added last year that I think we still need to keep on there is how they went learning from home. Some of my students aren't in full-time school and it is a real worry actually how many, I think it was in New South Wales, we went from 50,000 children learning at home to 100,000 over COVID who still aren't back at school. So it, or in partial placement. So we need to make sure that learning at home is happening. Even if they're not at school all day, we still need to make sure every half day you miss out on school, the compound effect on that learning is massive. So teachers, that's why I like having a form that tells what are the successful strategies, what routines have worked, what classroom placement. Some of my students are best near the door, some not. Some are best at sitting near the front, some at the back. A lot of you said visuals of what worked. Well, how about we send some examples of those visuals? How have you adapted activities? Um, those of you who've done my workshops know I often do the traffic light activity. You know, are they best with something like that? But the big one is this one. Can they ask for help? Because some of you said you have to check in with them. I think that is the number one thing teachers need to know the first day. Because if that student sat there waiting for you to come for help to ask them how they're going, they're used to someone checking in. Imagine that. Imagine you're in a new job and you're used to your boss checking in and you've never had to go to ask for help. Imagine how stressful that would be for some of my students who don't know who to ask for help, when to ask for help. One of my little boys many years ago said he'd rather have a meltdown than put his hand up for help. Can you imagine that? Like he'd rather like have that meltdown because asking for help, he didn't know how long he had to wait, when, what was going on, whether it was a good question and everyone would listen. But for some reason, a meltdown, it probably was more of a tantrum, got an instant response. So please be aware you're going to get behavior to ask for help if you don't set up systems for ask for help. Some of my students are selective mute because of their anxiety. So if you're highly anxious, it is nice that people check in with you. But if you're a child who's selective mute, maybe there's someone you can talk to. It might be a teacher assistant. It might be an office person. It might be learning support. Who can they talk to and check in? And I think that is the most important one. Now, I've just mentioned that helpful report and there's a couple of episodes I'd recommend you listen to. 
Um, that 168, which is the episode with Joan Shanahan, any of you with secondary, I think it's great for all ages. And episode 173 is talking through how to use that document that I've developed. So we're going to have another winner book. This is my must have no matter what behavior. Don't put your hand up if you've only just joined us because it throws my whole system out. But there are three in this series. I call it See a Behaviour, Look It Up. And at the back of your handout, you will see the three different books on the first page down the bottom of the resources. Um, And there is Behaviour Solutions for Inclusive Classrooms, my favourite. So basically, you have a behaviour, not following playground rules. Here are some ideas. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, losing materials and missing assignments boom 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 I love this book because an OT helped write it it is brilliant for all ages and stages so I'm going to give five of those away um let me okay let me just start I like to give one to each page so don't put your hand up sorry if you put your hand up it completely throws my screen so if people just don't put their hand up for a second so I can start okay brilliant thank you so much so Um, Michelle Hollier, you are winner number one. We have Susie Epposito. I hope I said that right, Susie. In the purple waving, brilliant, fantastic. Uh, Katerina Ilgilipo, or Poo, I'm sorry, I hope I said that right. Jen Younger, um, Anne-Marie S, hoping there's only one Marie, Anne-Marie S., and uh, I'm trying to find a full name there. Uh, Amanda Haight, H-E-I-T. So I think that is five. I, well, maybe it was six. But anyway, you can let Andrew know which one of the books you would like. Um, I highly recommend these books. They are just fantastic. I didn't write them, but I carry it around. It's fantastic. So let Andrew know which book you want. Now, support staff, Igor. You wanted to know how to give the best support. And look, there is not one answer. Remember, each child is so individual. But I love the fact you wanted to know that because in my experience, whenever we're asking ourselves that question, it shows we're on the right page. We're trying to individualize, think of that child. How do we give the best support? So what I know is the way to work out the best support is to build a great relationship with this student. And that E, tell me in the chat, how do you think the quickest way to build a great relationship with this student would be? Tell me in the chat. Make sure, yeah, listen. I love that, Susie. Talk to them, acknowledge them, share. Yeah, actually sharing about yourself. I have learned over the years for many of my students, me showing them a picture of my dog or cat, talking about my own kids, so often me sharing my own interests um, and often I find asking parents to send in photos from home or important things to that child, talking about their special interests, even if you know nothing about Minecraft, finding out what they love and just talking to them about that can make the world of difference. And you only need to spend one minute. That's all you need, you know. Um, I don't know anything about Pokemon, but my students know lots about it. And if I mention Pokemon, boom, they'll think I'm the best teacher they've ever met. So really thinking about that. The other thing I've learned over the years, many of my children have a different personal space. So be conscious. Some of my students need you to actually give them quite a lot of space. So don't get up too close, too fast. Some of my students love deep pressure and love me being close. Some of my students are best. I know when my kids were teenagers and they were learning to drive, I had my best conversations just sitting next to them, not giving that eye contact can be painful. So that's one of the things in my report I actually ask. What is their personal space? What is the best way to communicate with that student? Some of my students just sitting next to them, not saying anything for a minute, can be really, really powerful um, and giving them space. Thanks, Jennifer. I'm seeing you nodding your head. I always feel like I'm talking to myself, but 
really being aware that this student's way of engaging can be different to their peers and the same in the younger years. If this child's lying on their stomach, you need to lie on your stomach. Some of my students have only seen your shoes, you know. If they are a student who likes to line things up, most children with autism spectrum are still at parallel play. So don't go and start touching their train set. That is going to cause massive anxiety. You need to get your own stuff and sit next to them. And teacher assistants, sometimes they don't want you touching their work because they have OCD and they don't like mistakes. So you might need the same book and writing it out yourself. I have found over the years, some of my students do not like teacher assistants touching their things. So be aware of that. Um, knowing the signs of anxiety, obviously that's super important. Um, and dare I say, angels, what I find, different teachers have different roles for you. Remember we said if we had a new job, we'd want to know what we're meant to do. So often everyone assumes the teacher assistant knows what to do, but each teacher can have different expectations. Give me a thumbs up if you've seen that. And then the teacher assistant thinks they're doing the right thing. And then the teacher gets cranky, but no one told them that isn't their role. So I think knowing what your job description is and actually asking, what do you want me to do is vital. Um, and then finding out how to adapt tasks. And it's not just adapting tasks, it's pairing them with the right students. Sometimes I need my angels to be on that, making sure they're with the right kids and helping with social skills and friendships. Now, many of the schools I go into, we keep the teacher assistants the same for at least the first two weeks. We normally don't know the funding, the class sizes. Um, and if you don't know who the teacher's gonna be, I would highly recommend you keep the teacher assistant the same. It just means they don't have a new aide and a new teacher. So why not just give them the same aide for a couple of weeks? Can I tell you the teachers love it because they know what's expected. It's one less student for them having to be worrying about. Even if it's an hour a day, that angel comes in and models what they know about this student. You'll learn more watching the aide with the student than you will reading 100 reports in my experience. One of the things I am a big, big fan of, and I know some of you said in your um, questions, that's what you do, is reverse transition, where you go and visit the student in their current environment. So if you're the year five teacher, go and see them in year four. If you're the, depending what state you're in, reception kindy prep teacher, go to the preschool. Check out all the kids who are coming to your school next year. You will learn more in an hour visit than you will reading 100 reports. So give me a thumbs up if you've done that, by the way, reverse transition and found that helpful. Um, I think it's very, very helpful. Gosh, sorry. Um, those of you who did the early years, I lots of people said I spoke too fast. So I'm trying to talk slower this afternoon, but I've just realized the time is getting away from me. So I'm going to have to talk fast. So I apologize. You can watch the replay if I talk too fast, but I just um, have so much I want to share. And obviously an hour of your time is very precious. So I'm going to jam pack it. So Parents, carers, you play a very important role, particularly over January, making sure they don't get in a bad habit with their sleep. My kids are bad sleepers at the best of time, but if you don't keep the routine over the summer break, this is a nightmare trying to get them back ready for school. So give me a thumbs up if you've seen that. We're neurodiverse kids, that is the biggest struggle. Um, keep the routines going over the holidays. Keep an eye on their anxiety. As I said, really having those photos to turn back to, having the calendar when they're starting school, doing as many of those things as possible, having photo books, talking about your own emotions, really looking at that, maybe trying to organize some play dates with kids they do know. And remember that can be older kids. Knowing an older kid in the school can be very valuable. And as I mentioned, like helping them with their uniforms and organization too. Now, I mentioned Temple Grandin's course before. Uh, quite a few of you have done Temple. The reason I chose Temple's course to be a winner because I thought a lot of you hadn't done it. So you can choose whichever course you want to win. Mine, Tony, you can come to the live virtual next Friday if you want and I'll send a pack off to you. So you can choose whatever course you want to win. I am going to choose some winners. Cassie Collier, you are a winner there. Uh, Leone Mizzy eating that biscuit. I want some of that. It looks like a hobnob. You're a winner. You can choose a course. 
um, Karen Crouch, you can win a course and Bianca Hall. So if you let Andrew know, particularly if you want to come to the live virtual, just send us your address so I can send you a live virtual pack, which is like a show bag. Um, if any of you haven't done the live virtual, I send out like a goodie bag. It's like a show bag. Everyone gets different things. It's so much fun. So that's coming up. So the biggest thing I would like you to think about today is to put yourself in a student's shoes. Think how you feel when you start a new job, when you're going somewhere new. How does that feel for you? What do you need to know? Are you worried about what you're going to wear or who's going to be there? Because all of us have different worries. Now, we all worry about different things, but I think that's really important. And Jane, you talked about that transition between teachers. My experience is that transition between teachers, a lot of that has to do with executive functioning, the working memory, knowing what to take, um, losing things on the way. So um, you asked about like the books. This is where when I worked in a secondary, they actually in their locker, they had a bag like it was a green bag with everything they needed for English, a red bag with everything they needed for history that would have their book, their textbook, a different pencil case compared to maths where they needed a protractor. So I would have an actual whole bag they pulled out because what they tend to do is put all their books on top of each other. They pull one thing, everything falls out. Tell me in the chat, what were locker areas like when you went to secondary school? Tell me what they were like. What did that look like? Busy, awful, the sensory. Do you remember the smell, the teenage smelly years? Yes, and no offense, but you know, the often very noisy. So sometimes it's about sending them five minutes before, actually giving them time to go there. So really think about that. Now, Anna Tullerman's son said, Daniel said the best thing, and I think it's great. He said, Going to secondary school was like being at Westfield at Christmas. So they live in Brisbane. If any of you know Chermside Shopping Centre, the people are all spilling out of the shops and they've all got those bags and bumping into each other and, you know, on their device. He said that's what um, secondary felt like. So I say, parents, if you're getting your kids ready for secondary, head up to the Westfield Shopping Centre. Go to those busy places because... Secondary often have a thousand students. Actually getting them used to those crowds and noises and movement actually helps them be aware of what's going to work for them. Do they need their noise cancelling headphones? What do they need to help them cope in that situation? Now, any of you who follow me on Facebook, I put up a lovely visual with lots of ideas on there and I've included that in your handout, but things like practicing public transport. But the one on here I found invaluable is actually videoing. Actually videoing the school environment. Now you're not sharing it on YouTube or anywhere. It's just a private video for that student. You can stand in the locker area and video it so they can watch it back. Video the playground. Please don't do a visit when no one's on the oval. It's never going to look like that. Actually video a busy classroom, a busy school. I find when kids go to those open days, the school isn't full of a thousand children. It never looks like that again, all these empty classrooms. Actually videoing, the same in the preschool. Video the preschool, maybe video the teachers and the sounds. And if people have different um, tone of voice or accents, actually those teachers saying, hello, Sue, I'm looking forward to you coming into my class next year and maybe showing them a book or an activity they can do together so they can make those connections. I love that. And in secondary, who to go to for help, where to go to for help, actually videoing that so they can re-watch it back over and over. Okay, so I'm pretty sure you're all on here because you know the more we share, the more we can prepare. And I love the fact that you're all on here wanting to know what to do. So a lot of um, the questions I uh, were asked, I just wanted to make sure I covered them. Megan, you wanted to know how to keep it smooth. I think everything you're doing is amazing. The only thing I thought maybe you were missing was looking at those emotions and talking about emotions. Jess, how do you hand over twice exceptional students? Just be aware they're my kids who often mask 
and look calm and yes it's all good but inside that anxiety is building a lot of my twice exceptional kids i find they do that veneer and often the social anxiety um and the big question i had from sorry it said unknown because the person didn't put their name uh, but i had this from a few people how do you get everyone on board i don't know i wish i knew someone tell me in the chat i've been thinking about this art all afternoon how do we get everyone on board i find this really hard the people who have turned up here today you're already on board you know what we need to do um meetings thank you maxine i agree meetings but i always feel like the same people come not the ones i want to come it's like the people who do my training <laughs> often i feel like no send the people who didn't think they needed it <laughs> so, i don't know call me straight thank you for the, um, laughing a couple of you at that um isabella dealing with meltdowns without information i think this is the problem we need to share this information we need to because i'm all about proactive not reactive strategies so knowing who these students are is so important so the thing i need you to all understand the strategies are the same no matter what age so i want you all on the chat we are going to finish in the next four minutes everybody on the chat ready to answer this question okay you ready if we have a child in a wheelchair coming into a preschool what structural supports do we need in place for that child to come into the wheelchair uh, into the preschool everyone ramp okay now they're moving from preschool to primary school what do they need everybody same child in a wheelchair what do they need a ramp now that child's moving from primary to secondary what do they need everybody you're getting rsi and then from primary to post school options what do they need ramp wider doors accessibility toilets doesn't matter where they need the ramp so often what i find as students get older we go they should know by now they shouldn't need that color coding they shouldn't need this uniform desensitization they will because if you buy a new uniform it's going to feel different and every year feels like a new job to them and if you can think of it like that even though you've been a teacher at one school doesn't mean you don't get anxious going to a new school even moving year classes you might have taught year three and you're moving to year four so in my experience there are four keys to successful transition no matter what age no matter what age these are the ramps you need support 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 no matter what age and stage it's all about having the support and putting in place the things we've been talking about this afternoon so i would love you to all share in the chat what is your biggest takeaway from our hour of power because the hour's gone so fast so share in the chat what are you going to take away oh thank you karen i'm sorry it's gone so fast um support for all i love it so while you're doing that i'm just going to share a few things so you have now completed the hour of power the next thing i'd recommend if you haven't already download those cheat sheets and the student introducing themselves for them to share um, things to know about me and also if you haven't done one of my courses and would like to join me for a live virtual workshop on zoom um, i have one coming up next friday which is in sydney time and then wednesday week which is uh the wednesday after that which i'm just looking at the date sorry um uh, might have disappeared oh yeah on the 16th of november and that is in queensland time which will be better for south australian western australia and north uh northern territory so i hope you can join me can you please let anyone know about the upcoming virtual workshop they are really good fun i can't tell you how much fun they are and there's a recording you can re-watch um, for three months after we've had lots of people do them and amazing the evaluations have been as good as my face-to-face -face courses people tell me it's the best zoom they've ever done which is lovely of them to say um, but in my experience, um, the big thing about these live virtual is you can watch it anywhere, anytime. I've just been filling out, um, sending off the express post bags with the good, goodie bags. And I love seeing people from all over Australia, particularly regional areas. It just makes it accessible compared to traveling. There's also those podcasts that I'd recommend you listen to after today, um, particularly that one with Joan Shanahan. Um, and if you would be kind enough to just scan over that QR code 
and just give me feedback particularly any topics you'd like for next year um, and if I did talk too fast I'm really sorry I tried to slow it down <laughs> compared to the early childhood one we did a couple of weeks ago um, and Andrew's just put that in the tips as well so look the hours up I really appreciate you giving up an hour of your time um, and if anyone wants to stay on and ask questions I'm happy to do that um, I just wanted to let any anyone go who wanted to go so thank you everybody can't thank you enough for um, oh thank you it was worth your time Jennifer that is amazing I really appreciate that I hope you've got some great tips and strategies to make a difference Remember, strategies wear out and not every strategy works for everybody. If you're ready to dive in deeper to more strategies and ideas to make a difference, I'd highly recommend you consider Dr. Tony Atwood or my online courses. For more information, visit my website, www.sulaki.com.au.